you. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Jana. And I'm Alex. Uh, and we'll start with three short examples. Three little anecdotes. First off, say you reply to an email. Usually this means that the initial email is copied into yours, but without the author's permission. Okay, so this is it. Okay, um, say you doodle Bart Simpson. Simpson. Uh, and this is a der derivative work without the author's permission. Say you get a tattoo of, I don't know, Tom and Jerry. You have just created an unauthorized reproduction of a copyrighted work and potentially are also publicly displaying it. All right, so what, are, what do these three things have in common? Uh, they're all illegal and not in the, the way that, I don't know, you, you drank a, a beer before you were 18, but maybe more by the lines of uh, your uh, you're liable for thousands of euros in uh, uh, copyright infringement. Also, uh, if you want to break your uh, DRM on your DVD to make a, a copy for yourself, not for ev everyone else, you can't. So, The thing is that all these realities are part of everybody's daily existence, right? I mean, it's not just... Uh, Copyright has to do with a creative industries that has long since stopped being valid. Copyright issues affect more than just a small segment of the population. Right, and uh, the cost of production for um, creating work and producing and distributing, distribu distributing, sorry, distributing your work are really, really low, and that means that everybody can be an infringer. Uh, maybe not like this guy, <laughs> but maybe more like this. <laughs> now, you would be tempted to think that laws were meant to protect the best interest of the people, that reality should, I don't know, reflect legality. That would be great, but that's not really the case nowadays. Every single one of us is basically a copyright infringer at large, walking freely on the street, and that includes you, me, not five, not 20% of the population. Okay, so what's the problem? So laws should reflect reality, right? Because there are literally millions of articles, of studies, of books on copyright and uh, stuff like that. You can find them on Google, just Googling. Um, but the thing is, um, There's no public debate about this. Right. The thing is that although researchers are publishing, although legal experts are writing about this, this is still not accessible to the mainstream. I mean, the, we're not talking about this in public forums as much as we should, we believe. This is still relegated to a small niche of the audience. Right. So, uh, walking in the footsteps of Nina Paley, um, Kirby Ferguson, um, the Clay Sharkey, uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, Bob Reed, and so many others. We started working on our own web series, which tackles this, uh, all this stuff, and maybe hoping that these issues go to a larger audience. The web series is titled Copy Me, and it deals with most of the basic questions about copying, copyleft, copyright, and the like. It is actually, we're proud to say, it's the first ever animated web series that deals with such issues. Now, you may be wondering why we chose the medium of animation. Well, um, first off, because it's cute. <laughs> Second, because video is more accessible to people and maybe complex arguments um, come across easier. Third, because video is, uh, has a natural tendency to spread in social media. And last, but definitely not least, because video has great potential to spark off a debate, a conversation. It's actually the conversation that brought us all here today, I guess. Okay, so 
All our videos are licensed freely with just a CC BY license. Everybody can remix and so on. We have a forum on, um, on which everybody can contribute and make their own translations in every conceivable language. We don't have Polish yet, so maybe you can help us out with that. <laughs> and basically, our main goal is to change the way people in which think and talk about copyright and related issues. Ideally, we would like to make these seemingly complex issues more accessible. For instance, we'd like to convey that, you know, uh, more rights to the right holders doesn't necessarily mean more innovation. That intellectual property is not actually property at all. That, you know, it's a temporary state-granted monopoly that initially was supposed to fuel innovation. It was not supposed to be a permanent source of revenue endlessly flowing in the pockets of the rights holders. And innovation, sorry, okay. Uh, innovation has n no proprietary control forever. That means ideas and creation doesn't always happen because um, there is uh, money as an incentive or uh, proprietary control over it and uh, copyright is the exception and not the rule. Uh, what we need to understand is that we need a balanced system that uh, sees all the arguments and understands that uh, just talking about moral rights as copyright limits access to the public domain and, an, uh, and all our culture, and there are problems with copyright um, because it has big negative effects uh, for economic... Um, um, Both on the consumer and on right. the creativity of the so-called creative industries. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know how interesting that sounds, but uh, here's a cute picture of a cat in case you were bored or something. And you're also going to get to see a snippet of our latest episode, which is episode number three of a first season of eight. It deals with the early history of copyright. Before we watch, though, we would like to thank you for your presence and your time and your attention. Thanks. Thank you. Along came the first ever copying machine the printing press. It forever revolutionized the way people spread information. Here at last was a cheap and quick way to make copies of books, and a very accurate one too. The writers, of course, were thrilled to have more published books and a lot more readers. Yet, both the state and the church were absolutely furious. Suddenly, they could no longer control what people knew. Works of dissent and criticism were becoming just as circulated as the Bible and any other government-approved documents. So as the menace of printing spread during the 15th century, the church lobbied intensely across Europe to ban this new technology. It was poisoning people's minds and souls, of course. At one point in 1535, the Catholic Church of France even managed to enforce a law which forced the closing down of all bookshops. It also stipulated the penalty of death by hanging for anybody who used the printing press. Of course, this just made bootleg distribution channels bigger because people were just starving for more things to read. Meanwhile, in England, in 1557, Queen Mary I found herself unable to cope with a number of critical works that were being printed. So she came up with a different approach. Rather than trying to censor everything, she started a select exclusive club. Mary gave a royal monopoly to a printing guild, which took ownership over all printing activities in England. The London Company of Stationers, as they were called, basically worked as a private censorship bureau. The right to print was restricted to two universities and to the 21 existing printers. Books had to be first approved by the Crown Censor. And the stationers acted as a for-profit information police force with the right to confiscate and destroy any unauthorized presses or books. The Queen motivated the Guild's members financially and commercially. In tow, she managed to make sure that the government got its way. People were allowed their entertainment, 
because there was obviously a lust for reading, but only as long as nothing politically destabilizing was in circulation. And of course, this monopoly over information rather openly served the booksellers and the government's interests. The authors weren't even recognized as the work's real writers in the company register. Hmm. Uh huh. Cut to a century and a half later. By now, England's government has gradually relaxed its censorship control. The stationer's monopoly has been allowed to expire. This, of course, isn't making the stationers too happy. They were used to their little lucrative deal with the crown. So they gather their families on the stairs of the parliament. Tears in their eyes, they beg to have the monopoly reinstated. Of course, they know that parliament has no interest in bringing back the recently abolished state censorship. So they come up with a new bright idea to support their interests. How about from now on, writers should own their works? The stationers argued that printing presses and distribution required a lot of money. The writers would always depend on printers to make their works generally available. And the printers had no problem with copyright originating with the author. They knew authors were trapped. Authors had little choice but to sign those rights right back to a publisher for distribution. 